So, my question is to you. Earthquakes are <coughs> associated with hot weather? That's an old tricky question. And if you remember from old generations, people that were saying that, oh, it's very hot. An earthquake is in a minute. <laughs> who is, who votes for that? No one? No? Well, actually, that's a tricky one. <laughs> because if you're in a drought season, and if you rely on aquifers, and if you over pump water, you may have some small slippages with increased effective stress, just to take up from your bed during the night. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. But anyway, associated with uh, plate tectonics, Majority. And associated with plate tectonics and hot weather? <laughs> and becoming more frequent for uh, high tectonic activity with uh, large earthquake events and fake news. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's associated with basic plate tectonics. And you may get the old one on doing drive season. It's not really an earthquake. Yeah, okay. so I'm going to talk about uh, this one. Yes. Natural hazard mitigation, you know me, already introduced by Eva. And <clears throat> uh, these days, we're not just talking about natural hazards, we're talking also about natural hazards mitigation plan. I'm going to run a bit quickly, actually, because when I received the invitation from VETA, uh, I was really happy about it. And then Eva said, oh, you have only 20 minutes. Okay, good. So a natural hazards mitigation plan basically consists by risk assessment and mitigation strategy. And a risk assessment, uh, based on natural hazards, of course, uh, it consists on natural hazards themselves, when identified which they are, how often they occur, uh, the magnitude, the duration. And the other thing that we also we need to take into account is the vulnerability that we as a society may have. Natural hazards will always happen. It's how people, our societies get affected by them and what actually do with that. And sometimes we do some things that are very, very wrong, but that's, we learn from that. So population is important where these people are living, um, the economic generation, the built environment, administration. Do we have strong administration that if a natural hazard happens, then we can rely upon them to deliver and do whatever we have to do. But also, it's quite important that our society, do we have the well-being, uh, the enough prosperity to willing to mitigate, respond, prepare, and recover? Yeah, it's poor societies not always have this willingness. So on both those two circles, the area that is actually uh, uh, between each other, it's where we have the risk of disaster. This is when things can go wrong. Um, and of course, on the mitigation strategy plan, we need to have also the mitigation strategy. And you build that with uh, four directions, the mitigation goals. These were the ones that they uh, been investigated and discovered and discussed on the previous risk assessment. And you set up the goals. Um, <clears throat> and then based on these goals, design mitigation actions and i will speak briefly i will touch upon them just in a minute and these are quite important because they include also education outreach activities um, based on that you do a capability assessment because you okay you may have the wish list what you want to do as an action but do we have there is enough resources to do that so we have to prioritize not all societies among among us are equal uh, so that are developed, developing in poor societies. And based on that, you basically develop an implementation plan based on priorities, and based on, uh, on resources that you have available. Um, I spoke a bit of the mitigation actions and all these things that come together um, on this circle, where you have preparedness, response, recovery, prevention, protection. These are very well interlinked with mitigation actions. And if they done correctly, and also including society, they can uh, basically move towards resilience. This is what is the most important thing, resilience. If we can recover and we don't have to rebuild our world, we're saving resources and we can uh, uh, basically move forward with well-established damage. So 
Uh, prevention against actions necessary to prevent an imminent threat, not always the case with natural hazards, okay? Uh, protections, what we can do to protect ourselves against uh, natural hazards. Preparedness, how we prepare, and usually this is really based on education, okay? Response, how we respond when the earthquake or any other natural hazard may have happened, and how we do recover. So these are quite important ones. So I will now focus <clears throat> more on how we, geologists, with our knowledge, we can support and what we can do. So earthquakes are a natural hazard, of course. And we geologists, we can help with micro seismic zonation. We can embed this on the building codes. And a lot of countries, they have done that with Eurocode 7, Eurocode 8, and other standards. Uh, we can also help with ground investigation, uh, especially if you want to build a house or a large civil uh, infrastructure. What is the ground like? Is it soil? It's going to amplify an earthquake or not? We can use earthquake forecasting, and all this can be actually implemented into an early warning system. And of course, there are typical things, small things that we can do uh, to, to, to prevent some things like uh, recreation transmission lines and store earthquakes out of valves on, on water uh, network distribution systems. This is also, all these things can come from geological knowledge. Uh, next thing is tsunamis the DO2 and geological mapping uh, is very important. We can also map the past occurrences. We can develop risk maps. We can also develop early warning systems um, based on, uh, on geological knowledge. And this is something that is, has been done very extensively during the, uh, in the Mediterranean zone. Well, it's a very good system actually that helps people. Landslides. Very important topic. I will also agree on that. And geologists, they can map the extent, they can map the geology, uh, the, the, the aquifers that they interlinked. And these days we have also into our arsenal remote sensing with INSAR technology. So, you know, after a while, after successive passes, we can even detect minute movements on the ground. And together with an in situ monitoring system, we can basically have an early warning system. Uh, that they can uh, support uh, uh, and prevent or warn if something in is going to happen. Uh, volcanoes, we all love volcanoes. This is what uh, sometimes gets a uh, uh, geologist uh, excited, but they can cause natural hazards, of course. But we have this day seismographs, remote sensing, again, we can use that. Uh, we have observatories, a lot of geologists, uh, they're actually working on that, they offer knowledge. Uh, they do all sorts of research. And again, this can also be combined into an early warning system and uh, inform society if something's going to happen. Floods, they happen a lot, during, certainly in Central Europe. They cost billions of euros. So these are money that actually have been refrained from other development. We should use this money uh, for you know, uh, a fair society rather than start rebuilding and rebuilding again all the time. Um, and geologists, they can help also with that, with classical mapping. Uh, we go out, we, we see the extent of the floods in the past. Uh, we also can create nation maps. We can also offer solutions on nature-based solutions. One would be uh, 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 aquifer recharge. We can claim that water and we can use it for drought periods. So it's, it's a resource. And actually, if it be used correctly, then it will not damage. We can also implement it, all these things into early warning systems. And of course, there are some things that we can advise on people if I have to put uh, pubs with submersible or inland pubs. Um, uh, so uh, erosion, where we can have a high erosion effect. All these are things that we can uh, support our society. Uh, droughts, all of these small climate change on overall picture. Still, we can learn from the past, unlock the knowledge and use it for the future. Um, and most importantly, uh, combine our knowledge with our other disciplines. We can uh, support on that. Uh, an interesting thing is that uh, Israel and Malta, instead of uh, putting a lot of resources, actually they uh, have uh, implemented a very aggressive monitoring system, especially Malta is very successful on that. Um, they had something like uh, three decentralization plans. I think they have only one because they monitor very efficiently for leakage. 
So that's that's very important because uh, you you win on energy, but also on water resources. Uh, wildfires again. This is not so much on on, on actual geological uh, perspective. I mean, in a small scale, but on a large scale, it's it has to do with climate change and all sorts of things. You can again again use um, geological mapping. Uh, the, this has been recorded on geological records. Wildfires, Herboniferous is one of them. Um, so we can use all sorts of uh, things there uh, to, to offer also uh, to the civil services and civil agencies um, on, on how we can uh, also support them with this one, although on a limited scale compared to the other ones. Sinkholes. Okay, that's, that's something that in the past we didn't consider, but it happens more and more, more often because obviously we go and build into these places. We didn't used to live in this kind of places, so to do something wrong, but now we live, we also install, install water pipes, drainage pipes, and all sorts of things, so they have critical erosion. Geologists also, they can be very helpful here. Uh, we can map what is underneath. Um, you know, uh, limestones are quite successful to these ones. We can also use the geophysics and identify where potential locations might exist. Uh, Hydrogeology is also quite important because you can see where the water might go through all this and actually develop uh, the, the dissolution effect. So all these are quite important ones. So all these are important. They uh, basically produce a mitigation strategy. And I try to demonstrate how geologists are important to all of these things. But there is a but. I briefly mentioned early warning system, but I didn't elaborate on, on that much, but it's everywhere. And these days, you cannot have an early warning system that is effective without including us, society, okay? So people-centered early warning system are very vital because they're important for multi-hazards mitigation. We live in a different society. We're living in a COVID pandemic, it still exists. And if you are in Greece, you may have wildfires and why not earthquakes? And this can happen simultaneously. And if you live in Ukraine, you may even have war happening all the same time. So you have so many things happening at once. We're not living in an era that uh, you have individual natural hazards occurring at once. And yeah, okay, you can mitigate the risks. You have everything can happen at once. And this without involving people, it cannot happen. So risk knowledge, we have to pass the risk knowledge to the people, to the society, to the communities. Monitoring and warning services, people can also be part of it. I'm involved in one project that actually we develop um, adroit applications and people can have this application. And they, I mean, if they see something happening or if they, there is a natural harbor uh, that has happened and people that are in need, they can send directly the information to the civil protection agencies. And so that can help in a decision-making system for people to act very precisely and actually have a huge impact on, on mitigation. Again, dissemination communication is very important. And response capability. If we train communities on how to respond, then we have a winner here. So it's, it's a bottom-up uh, approach, but I'm afraid it's the only solution. We are all of us part of the solution. So. That's me, thank you.